Welcome to the Faith Broadcast. I'm so glad that you're watching today's message. I believe it'll be a blessing to you. I believe it'll encourage you, it'll strengthen you, and it'll empower you to make Jesus famous in your everyday life. Enjoy today's message, and I'll see you at the end of the broadcast. God, go with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. You know, last Wednesday, we began to talk about ruling and reigning, and we looked at that in one part of the way, and this past Sunday, we talked about cultivating. We're in right now in our series, we're talking about delegated authority and using the authority and the dominion God has given us, and we'll do a brief part of review, and then we'll go into the ground we're going to cover tonight. And if you happen to miss last week or you missed Sunday, they're available on our YouTube channel for Faith Christian Center. Also, they're available on our Faith Plus app. If you haven't downloaded our Faith Plus app, it's available in your app store. Just type in Faith Plus and you'll be able to see it. And we have all of our messages on there for free, plus so much more content that will encourage you and help you live this lifestyle of faith. And so I'm going to just do a few minutes worth of review until we go to where we're going tonight. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, starting with verse 26. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. Come on, say it loud and put it in the chat. Say dominion. Come on, say it loud and put it in the chat. Say dominion. Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, created he, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. As we talked about last week and on Sunday, the phrase have dominion means to rule and to subjugate. The phrase have dominion means to rule and to subjugate. Come on, say it with me. Say rule and subjugate. Go ahead, say it out loud and put it in the chat. Say rule and subjugate. One more time. Say rule and subjugate. So the phrase have dominion means to rule and to subjugate. Rule means to exercise ultimate power and authority over. Rule means to exercise ultimate power and authority over. That word rule means to exercise ultimate power and authority over. Subjugate simply means to bring under domination or control. Subjugate means to bring under domination or control. We also saw the word subdue in the verse we read. And subdue means to bring into subjection and keep under. And we'll get more of that next week. The word subdue means to bring into subjection and keep under. Now I'll go to the next chapter, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Still doing some review. If you missed this, you can go to our YouTube channel on the Faith Plus app or our podcast and catch up what we covered last week on last Wednesday as well as on Sunday. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. The word tend means to cultivate and to work. We talked about that on Sunday. The word tend means to cultivate and to work. You're supposed to cultivate what you've been given. And I encourage you, if you missed Sunday's message, of course, go to Faithless app or podcast or YouTube channel and catch up on that because we're not going to get into it tonight. The word keep means to guard and to care for. The word keep means to guard and to care for. As we shared before, the original assignment was to cultivate and guard what they had been given, and to expand their dominion over the entire planet. We shared that they were given dominion over the ground itself and over all the things in the air as well. If we do not operate in dominion, I'll say it this way. If you do not operate in dominion and your original assignment, you'll not be able to expand the areas of your dominion. Your authority is not random. It is connected to your assignment. Come on, say it out loud and put it in the chat. Say, my authority is connected to my assignment. Well, say it out loud, put it in the chat. Say, my authority is connected to my assignment. One more time. Say, my authority is connected to my assignment. Your assignment has expansion potential. However, you must use your authority and cultivate and guard what you've been given. So we summed it up by saying you must rule, you must subjugate, you must cultivate, and you must guard. We said you must rule, you must subjugate, you must cultivate, and you must guard. 
One more time. You must rule. You must subjugate. You must cultivate. And you must guard. You're able to do all of these things through the authority that has been delegated to you. And in the same way Adam was given authority, you have been given authority by Jesus. And we talk about that throughout the month of April, how we can have faith in the name of Jesus. And we talk about the authority that is given us in that name and the right to use that name. And we'll get into a little bit further during this series about the authority that has been granted us. And so we can learn these lessons from Genesis because this is still God's plan for man and it's still his plan for his body who he's given authority to. So let's go to Romans 5, 17 and do a tad bit more review before we go to where we're going tonight. Romans 5, 17. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. It says, For if by the one man's offense death reigned through one, much more those who receive abundance of grace, come on, say abundance of grace, and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. As we shared last week, the degree of your reign or rule is determined by how much grace you receive. The degree of your reign or your rule is determined by how much grace you receive. You receive the gift of righteousness when you were born again. You are of the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In your daily life, you must position yourself to receive more grace. There's grace for your everyday life. There's grace for your family and your relationships. There's grace for your calling and your finances. There's grace for every area of your life. As we talked about last week, God gives more grace. And it's our job to position ourselves to receive more grace. And on Sunday, we shared how we must cultivate what we've been given. Tonight, we're going to focus more on the aspect of ruling and something that can get in the way of our ruling the way God wants us to. So we see we receive the gift of righteousness and we receive abundance of grace. We are to reign in this life, but there's something that can get in the way of our ruling and our reigning. Remember, we said rule means to exercise ultimate power and authority over. So let's look at verse 17 and examine who is doing the ruling or the reigning. Let's look at verse 17. And we see in the first part of the verse that death is reigning. Now, when we talk about death, especially in Romans 5 and other places, it's not just talking about physical death. It's talking about the sin death that entered into the world when Adam sinned. It is the darkness. It is the curse. It is manifestations of death, not just physical death, but it is sickness. It is disease. It is the manifestations of the curse you see in Deuteronomy 28. It is the effects of sin for the wages of sin is death, as it says earlier in Romans. This is the type of death it is talking about. This is this death that was released through Adam's sin was is reigning in the earth. It is still a dominant force in the earth. That's not removed. It's still there. Death still reigns on earth in certain areas and in certain people's lives. It is still ruling and reigning in people's lives today. However, those who receive the gift of righteousness and an abundance of grace can exercise greater power, authority, and control than the reign of death. Because death is still in this world and sin death is still in this world and this is a fallen world and we live in a fallen world system, it is still prevalent. It still runs. It still runs rampant through the earth. But just because it runs rampant in the earth doesn't mean it has to run rampant in your life. Because you've received an abundance of grace. If you're positioning yourself to receive more and more grace every day and you have the gift of righteousness, you can reign in life. You can exercise greater power, greater authority, greater influence than what death is doing in the earth. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Let's look at it a different way to kind of phrase this. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, thank God, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So we see two laws here. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And then we see the law of sin and death. Both of these laws are still working in the earth. Both of them are working in the earth. However, one is a higher law. Operating by the principles and the laws of the kingdom calls you to rise higher and rule over the lower laws. Death and the law of sin and death are still in the earth. However, by operating by the principles of the laws of the kingdom, you can rise higher and operate above them. You know, for example, it's like an airplane. 
you know, we all are familiar with the law of gravity. What goes up must come down. If you jumped up right now, you're coming down right back to the ground. It's a law. However, an airplane can fly because it's operating by the law of lift. And as long as it's operating by the law of lift and it has the fuel it needs, it will keep going and defy the law of gravity. The law of gravity doesn't disappear. The plane is just operating by a higher law. In the same way the law of sin and death didn't disappear, death has not disappeared from the earth. But for those who reign in life by the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, by those who live by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, can live higher than the effects of the law of sin and death. Now, let me show you something that can get in the way of you reigning and get in the way of you ruling and get in the way of you experiencing what's been made available to you. Go with me to Proverbs 18. And one of the things we're doing right now is we're going through the book of Proverbs right now and our No Longer Mere Mortal May Challenge. And this challenge we encourage you to do every day. Number one, pray the Ephesians 1 prayer for yourself and your spirit of influence. The Ephesians 1 prayer is found in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 through 23. Personalize it and pray for yourself and your spirit of influence. Number two, read a chapter of Proverbs of the day. You know, there's 31 days in May, 31 chapters of Proverbs. Read the chapter to this corresponding day. And number three, invest in your call. Take time every single day to invest in your calling, to take it further, to do what God has called you to do. All right, so Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20, some of the reading that you did today. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20 and verse 21. It says, a man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The word power there, you know, it's also translated as the word hand. So it also means power or direction. And so we saw in verse 20 that someone will be satisfied by the fruit of their mouth, the words of their mouth, by the produce of their mouth, they will be filled. Death and life are in the direction or the control or the power of the tongue and those who love it. Well, how do you love that, that power control by what you continually say? Well, eat of its fruit. So what fruit will you be satisfied with? What produce of your lips will you be filled with? It's up to you. Because death and life are in the control or the hand or the direction of the tongue. And those who love it, those who consistently abide by it, will be satisfied, filled by the words of their mouth. And so when you look at your life, what is your life filled with? If you don't like what your life is filled with, I encourage you to look at what you've been saying because the words of your mouth, your tongue can get in the way of you ruling and reigning and walking in the authority and dominion given to you in Jesus. Your mouth can get in the way. Let me read you some more scriptures. Because the words of your mouth help determine what law you operate by and what rules your life. The words of your mouth help determine what law you operate by and what rules in your life. Proverbs 15, 4 says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it, in what? In the tongue, breaks the spirit. Proverbs 12, 13, and 14 says, The wicked is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous will come through trouble. A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hands will be rendered to him. Proverbs 13, 2, a man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the unfaithful feeds on violence. Proverbs 13, 3, he who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Proverbs 18, 6 and 7, a fool's lips enter into contention and his mouth calls for blows. A fool's mouth is his destruction and his lips are the snare of his soul. Now go with me to James chapter 3 and we'll read to you from the New Living Translation. James chapter 3. Your words are powerful. Your words matter. Come on, put it in the chat. Say, my words matter. Come on, put it in the chat. Say, my words matter. They do. Your words matter. You know, the old kid, you know, added to say, well, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Lies. Words hurt. Words are powerful. James chapter 3 verse 2. It says, indeed, we all may make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we could be perfect or mature and could also control ourselves in every other way. Notice this, notice this, notice this. The way you control your body and you control your flesh and you control your mind comes through you controlling your mouth. That if you can learn to control this thing, you can control your entire body. 
you can control your thought life. James goes on and says, we can make a large horse go wherever we want by the means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it's set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing pouring, come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. So think about it this way. If mankind has not been successful in taming the tongue, is it impossible? No. Because James says this, you know, James 3, 2 through 10 describes the life of a lot of believers. It's not just talking about unbelievers, it's talking about believers. You know, you say the right thing one moment, say the wrong thing the next. You bless God one moment, you cuss out your neighbor the next. This is not right, James was saying. And he's saying your mouth can set your life on fire, not just any fire, but hell fire. You know, you look at your life, it seems like, you know, hell's burning up. You say, oh, the devil's been busy. No, your mouth has been busy. Your mouth could have set your own life on fire with the fire of hell. And so what gets in the way of your ruling, what gets in the way of your dominion, what gets in the way of you experiencing the authority that God has granted you and living the life God has for you are the words you are continually saying. So how can we tame this tongue? Because it's not just about what you say during the experience, what you say on Wednesdays, what you say on Sundays, what you say during your time of prayer. What are you saying consistently? What are you saying continually? What words are coming out of your mouth on a regular basis? How can you tame your tongue? Because your tongue can stand between you ruling and reigning in life. And if you don't get in control of your tongue, instead of you ruling, you'll be ruled over. Instead of you dominating, you'll be dominated. And you know what you'll be dominated by? You'll be dominated by the words of your mouth. You'll be dominated. You'll be filled. You'll be satisfied with the wrong words. And so you wonder why death is dominating, why the laws of sin and death are dominating. It's because you've been operating by the law, but in the wrong way, operating by the words that come out of your mouth. And it sets your life on fire from hell. It's time to extinguish that fire and get control of our tongues so we can say the right things. Now, so here are a few things that will help you create the life you're supposed to have and control that tongue. Number one is very simple. It's very elementary. Number one, ask God to help you. This is not that deep. It's simple. But a lot of times we forget about that. Number one, ask God to help you. Go ahead and put it in the chat. Say, ask God to help. Come on, put it in the chat. Ask God to help. Psalm 141 verse 3 says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. Psalm 19 verse 14 in the New Living Translation says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Ask God to help you. Say the right things. Ask him to help you put a guard over your mouth. Now, when you do, it's not like he's going to just take a key and zip your lip and not allow you to talk. No, you still have a free will. But what he will do, and I've seen it in my own life, and I know others have seen the same thing, is that when you ask him to do it, when you're about to say something, you'll get a check on the inside. Like, don't say that. And it won't, be a, it won't always be a loud check. It'll be just a gentle, uh-uh, don't say that. Mm -mm, don't bring that up. Oh, no, don't say those words. And you're going to have a choice in that moment, whether you stop mid-sentence or you don't even start the sentence in the first place and you go say something else or do something else. Or we override that leading and say it anyway because that's what you wanted to say or how you were trained to talk or you just want to respond. See, that on the inside, that check, that leading was the guard. It was the help of God, the help of God, the Holy Spirit of God. Leading you say, hey, I'm trying to help you. You asked me to help you. Let me help you. That is the guard over your mouth, your spirit man. When you ask God to help you, he will help you through your spirit. The Holy Spirit leading your spirit, giving peace to your spirit, giving the unction to your spirit, giving the direction to your spirit about what to say and what not to say. So number one, ask for his help. And this goes with number one, let him help you obey his leading, receive his help. 
Number two, pray in the spirit. Number two, pray in the spirit. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're going to start with verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. So for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no man understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies or builds himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. So give me now to verse 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, or if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. So when you're praying in tongues, you are yielding to the Holy Spirit and allowing him to give you the words to say. When you are praying in tongues, you are yielding to the Holy Spirit and allowing him to give you the words to say. So what are you doing? You're training your tongue to speak what God says. Every time you yield and you pray in the Spirit, you are yielding your tongue to the Spirit of God. And he's giving you words to say. This is a good practice he gets you into. So the more time you spend praying in the Spirit, the more time you're training your tongue to yield to what God says. This will help train your tongue as well. Number three. Number three. Continually speak the word. Number three. Put it in the chat. Say continually speak the word. We said number one, ask God for his help. Number two, pray in the spirit. Number three, continually speak the word. Let me show you how that's going to help. Go to Joshua chapter one, verse eight. Go with me to Joshua chapter one, verse eight. Joshua chapter one, verse eight. And says, notice the instruction God gave to Joshua. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Meaning you keep it in your mouth. What does that mean? You keep saying it. But you shall meditate in it day and night. The word meditate means to think on, to say, to mutter. That you may observe. That means to guard, to do according to all that is written, that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. The word staying in your mouth. The word that you speak continually will train your tongue and it will make your way prosperous. Speaking the word continually helps you to follow and guard the instructions contained in the word. Through your speaking and your obedience, because you're guarding it, that means you're going to also you're guarding to do it. You're going to do it. Through your speaking, you make your way prosperous and you have good success. Through your speaking and through your obedience, you make your way prosperous and you have good success. So the more you say it, it's going to help you guard the instructions that are in it. And it's going to help you do what God says. So we said number three, continually speak the word. Go with me now to Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. 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 It says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Broader vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you, for every idle word men may speak, they'll give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words will you be justified, and by your words will you be condemned. Continually speaking the word and hearing the word causes you to store up the word in your heart. That word treasure means to store up, to have in abundance. And we'll see that in Psalm 119, verse 11. Go with me to Psalm verse 1, Psalm, excuse me, Psalm 119, verse 11. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That word hidden or hide means to treasure or to store up. Remember what you storing up, Jesus says, out of the abundance of your house, your house, excuse me, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak because your heart here is compared to a storehouse. 
So your heart is a storehouse. What you keep putting in the storehouse will come out your mouth. If you want to train your tongue to say the right things, you have to keep putting the word in. You put in the word in by speaking. You put in the word by praying it. You can see in a minute, you put in the word by singing it. You put in the word by hearing it. If you continually get yourself in a place where you're speaking the word, reading the word, receiving the word, you can fill your heart up with the word. And guess what? Your mouth will speak the word. Now go with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. And it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Continually speak the word, which includes faith confessions based upon the word, singing scriptural songs, and continually saying what God has told you concerning your call, your path, and your purpose. Let's look at this verse again, Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. So as we're sharing that, one of the keys to storing the word is continually being in the word. And it is by reading it, by speaking it, by hearing it. But we see here is also by singing it, by sharing with others, by talking to other faithful friends and having accountability and sharing the word with them. But also one of the things I encourage you to do and say on a regular basis is say things that God has told you about your call, about your path. Remember, we've talked about, especially this month, about there is a general call upon every believer's life. There's a general way every believer should live. There's a general path every believer should follow. But there are some specifics about your call. There are some specifics about your path. There are some specifics about your way that you get from the leading of the Spirit of God who lives within you and rests upon you. And so he will give you things to say about your life, about your family, about the way and what the plan God has for your life. And of course, those words won't contradict the word of God, but there'll be specific spirit-inspired words. And spirit-inspired words always win. And so when God tells you to say this about yourself on a regular basis, that is what you say. It'll build the word in your heart and help you control your tongue as well. The words you are speaking are building your faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing about the words of the word of God. The words you're speaking are helping to renew your mind with the word of God because when you're speaking it, it's helping you to guard the instructions that are given to you in the word of God. These are words, as you heard me just say, that you should say every single day. However, there is a difference between faith confessions and faith declarations. What well, everything I've been describing to you by saying the word, reading out loud, saying confessions based off the word of God, paraphrasing the word of God and personalizing it and finding the promises of God that are that pertain to you in the new covenant and saying that about yourself. Those are faith confessions, singing songs based off the word of God and God's faithfulness and his promises and sharing the word of God, encouraging others with the word of God. Those are things we can label under faith confessions, things you just say every single day. And these are things that build your life. Faith confessions help you build your life. It builds your faith. It frames and renews your mindset. It strengthens you in the ways of God. And these are things you should say every day. Go ahead, say out loud and put it in the chat. Say every day. Come on, say out loud, put it in the chat. Say every day. These are things you should do every day. Where there's a difference between faith confessions and faith declarations. So what do I mean by faith declarations? Because some people just merge faith confessions, declarations by their definitions. So let me define what I'm talking about here. Declarations as an expression of your authority that addresses certain situations, circumstances, or demonic entities. Declarations as an expression of your authority to address certain situations, circumstance, or even demonic entities. Go with me to Mark chapter 11, and let's follow the example of Jesus. So we'll begin to close here, and we'll pick this up here later, either on Sunday or next Wednesday. Mark chapter 11, verse 12. Mark chapter 11, verse 12. This is now the next day, when they had come up out from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he could find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it is not the season of figs. 
In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard. When evening had come, he went out of the city. Now in the morning as they passed by, we're going to skip down to verse 19. When the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter remembering said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you curse has withered away. And so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you that whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Let's analyze this portion of scripture as we close. Mark chapter 11, this is followed, this includes a triumphal entry. And Jesus, when he studied out, he bolts into the temple, sees everything, and he leaves. And then he comes back the next day, and he sees the fig tree. Now, he's already passed by the fig tree before, at least once, maybe more. He then speaks to the fig tree and goes on his way. Now, when he studied out, the fig tree didn't wither immediately. It took about 24 hours. And when you study it out, this fig tree dried up from the roots. Now, one of the things you'll learn about this is about the way Jesus operated. And maybe we'll get into it Sunday, next week. You know, we talk about the book. We've talked about so many times. If you've been a faith Christian, you hear me say it all the time, especially how I pray. Jesus said that he only said what he heard his father say. And he only did what he saw his father do. So why would Jesus speak to the fig tree? Because his father told him to. Well, why did he say those words to the fig tree? Because that's what his father told him to say or to declare to the fig tree. Then he went up to the temple. He cleared out the temple. And after he cleared out the temple, he preached a message based on my father's house is a house of prayer. And after he taught all day, he laid hands on the sick and many were healed. And then he went home. And then when they came back the next day, Peter saw the fig tree that had been withered from the roots. So there are times when you'll make a declaration of faith and it doesn't happen immediately. Those words go to the root of the problem, not the fruit of the problem. And those words deal with the roots before it deals with the fruit. Now, something I want you to know here before we close. You have to, when it comes to faith declarations, so when a problem pops up, a circumstance, a situation pops up, you're being resisted by some demonic entity and it's standing in the way of your path, of your call, what God has called you to do, there's some imposing situation in your life. Don't just start writing off scriptures. Well, the Bible says this, the Bible says that. Oh, you start throwing your faith confessions. Faith confessions are good, but remember, we said they're to build your life. They strengthen you in your faith. They build your faith. They help renew and frame your mindset and it frames your life. But when it concerns faith declarations, and speaking to situations and problems. You need to follow the example of Jesus because he then says that if you speak to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in your heart, but believe that those things you say shall come to pass, you shall have what you say. But pause, those aren't random words. Those aren't the words of your faith confession. Where did those words come from? From the Spirit of God. So when it comes to faith declaration and addressing situations so you can rule and reign and resist and overcome and operate in the highest authority and power, ultimate power over what is resisted to you, you need to pause and ask God, sir, what do I say about this? What do you want me to say to this mountain? What do you want me to say to this situation? What do you want me to say to this circumstance? What do you want me to say, sir? You pause and whatever he tells you to say, that's what you say. And then you leave it alone. Faith confessions are what you say every day to build your faith. They are the word of God, the paraphrase from the word of God. But when it comes up to situations and mountains you run into in life, you don't start rattling off your faith confessions and rattling off every scriptural promise you know. No, those are to build your faith, to train your tongue, to build your life, to frame your mindset. That's what that is for. But when it comes to addressing these problems, these circumstances, these situations, these demonic entities, you need to pause and follow the example of Jesus. And, Sir, what do I say to us? So when you speak to the fig tree, when you speak to the mountain, you get the intended results. 
So in order to make an effective faith declaration, you need to pause and ask God, what should I say about this? And as you speak those things and you don't doubt in your heart, you'll have exactly what you say. Praise God. I'm going to pause it right there. We've covered a lot of great ground tonight. Come on, let's pray and thank God. Father, we thank you for the word. Oh, we thank you for the word that you share with us tonight. Help us not just to be hearers of this word, but to be doers of this word so we can be blessed in our doing. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise for these wonderful things. In Jesus' name, amen, and so be it. Praise God. Amen. I believe today's message encourages you, it's strengthening you, it's helping you to live the lifestyle of faith. If you're ever in the Metro Atlanta area, we'd love for you to worship with us in person. You can find information about our different locations at FCCGA.com. Also, we have so many different ways where you can get the word. You can download our Faith Plus app. You could also visit us on our social media pages on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube. We'd love for you to connect with us. We also have a podcast on Apple Podcasts as well well as on Spotify. We have two. One is called the Faith Podcast, and then we have our daily devotional podcast, which is called Faith in the Morning. I look forward to seeing you on many different social media platforms and in person at Faith Christian Center. Thank you so much for tuning in, and remember, something good is going to happen to you today, so expect miracles. God bless.